thank you so much for inviting me along to uh, share this with you um, this evening, this afternoon, this morning, depending where, where you are, um, where you're listening from. A very warm welcome to you all. And this focus today on trauma-informed practice. And so I'm going to share a PowerPoint. So uh, about 40 minutes of sharing with you some aspects of trauma-informed practice and then there'll be the opportunity for you to ask any questions either through the chat uh, function as, as Anne has suggested or to uh, unmute yourself and, and come on. I'll just invite you to pop a hand up at that at that point um, and uh, you can either put a virtual hand up or you can put a real hand up We'll look out for, for both there. So a short introduction to trauma-informed practice for practitioners who work with people who experience emotional trauma. I'm not looking at this today from, specific, from a particularly therapeutic perspective, but more from a more generic, a more general kind of uh, sense of how you can uh, support people um, with, with trauma and how to recognize when, when trauma is there, because it shows up in all kinds of different, different ways. So what's in this, uh, this presentation this afternoon? Why be interested in psychological trauma? So what, what the factors are that, that make it important to, to be aware of, what it actually is and how you can recognize it. And as I've already said, there are a variety of different ways that it can show up. How we can respond to it in ways that are supportive and safe. So one of the really important parts of working with people who um, have been traumatized, have had emotionally traumatic experiences, um, is that we, we need to, at, um, at a really basic level, we need to do no more harm. So we need to, to be able to support them in a, safe, in a safe way. And there are many things that we can do by understanding more about trauma, uh, both in our one-to-one -one interactions with them, encouraging other people in their more trauma-informed approach, but also in terms of what we do in classrooms, groups, um, community settings, and so forth. So just to introduce myself, there's me looking uh, sort of professional. Uh, not that I'm suggesting I look unprofessional tonight, but uh, that's me professional. That's what I've been looking like quite a lot recently, like a lot of us, I think. Um, although in the UK, uh, things have eased a little bit on, on the mask wearing front um, there. And uh, this is what I look like when I'm relaxed. Um, this is Dory, the current love of my life, but don't tell my partner that. Um, she's uh, just over a year old now. She's a Tibetan terrier. And uh, you will probably hear her coming home uh, in about 40 minutes or, or so. Um, she is, um, yeah, she's, she's beautiful and very challenging at the same time. Okay, uh, just so in terms of um, my, my background, uh, so I've, I've been 30 plus years now working in education and uh, first uh, as a teacher, and then uh, more recently, um, having trained as a professional coach, as a counsellor, as a hypnotherapist, and in um, family therapy uh, approaches, I work now in private practice and also do extensive work in schools. And um, there's, there's at least one person uh, here tonight who knows uh, about the training work that I do, because we've done some, did some work with some fantastic people from Sierra Leone. Uh, a few years back, uh, two groups of those. I'm also just beginning the route to a doctorate looking at the use of emotional freedom technique, which is a, a very helpful novel therapy for working with post-traumatic stress disorder and, and other aspects of stress and trauma. And I'm gonna say a little bit about that later on in, in the session, but it's something that's very easy to learn and very easy for people to use on their own. They don't necessarily need um, a therapist or a, um, a counsellor to be with them using that. Um, like most people, I've had my own fair share of trauma over the years, and I think that's one of the things that really drives me, both as an educator and also um, as, a, as a practitioner uh, in, um, in private practice to support people with trauma. So I'd like to invite you to do just 
a few moments uh, of an activity. As I'm going to share with you later on, dealing with trauma, working through emotionally traumatic uh, experiences, one of the biggest things we can do to support other people towards that is to focus on our strengths, to focus on the things that we do well. There are some specific ways that we can use our awareness of the things we do well, our strengths, our abilities, that can actually help to heal up trauma and reset the parts of the nervous system that become overwhelmed um, during traumatic experiences. So I'd like you to, to invite you to think back um, over the last year or so to all the ways that you feel good about what you've overcome, the problems that you've solved, the difficulties that you've dealt with. Try to keep that focus on what you've been successful with. And if you wish, you could jot a few ideas down for yourselves. You won't be sharing these with anyone else, so it's very much a, a personal reflection. So just, just take a few moments to think back over all the things that you feel good about, about the things you've overcome uh, in, in say, the last year. Notice how it feels, the good feelings, the positive thoughts. And in particular, if you think about one thing that you feel good about over the last year, where is that positive thought or feeling located in your body? Where do you get the body sensation that says that that was a good thing? And if possible, add some labels to those strengths or attitudes that you brought um, to the, the events of the, the last few months. So how could you label that? Is there a label of um, resourcefulness? Um, I'm pleased with that. It doesn't have to be a, a fancy, fancy word. It can be uh, a phrase. I'm going to come back to one aspect of that a little bit later on and to look in, in more general terms at the importance of using our strengths and our what, what we feel uh, have been our successes, what we've overcome. So we'll come back to that. Why be interested in psychological or emotional trauma? Here's a graph. This is taken from uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work on uh, grief and change. And <clears throat> I wrote an article about this, which you can find at, at the link that's uh, at the bottom uh, of this graph. And I wrote this right at the beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic in the UK, when, when it, it hit the UK. And I'm working, I work a day a week in, in schools, um, uh, in school, uh, I do a lot of work in private practice, as I've said, and I was starting to see a lot of signs of people's um, responses and reactions to um, to what was happening and the change that was being forced on us um, at that time. And um, this graph is a really helpful and interesting map of the way that difficult, challenging things can affect us. So we might go through some um, experiences <clears throat> such as shock and confusion. We might go through periods of trying to carry on as normal, almost denial, uh, not aware of the, um, or not trying not to, to pay attention to, to, to what's going on, um, a kind of um, avoidant response. Not deliberate, it's, it's, a, it's a degree of, of, of strategy to cope. We may go through a period of strong emotions, anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, um, or, and every emotion in between. We then might experience a period of withdrawal, oh, step back. Um, and I think we might just um, need to mute. Um, thanks. 
then we might go through a period of withdrawal where we, we step back. And if we stay in that withdrawal stage, that might um, lead to some symptoms we might refer to as depression. Um, we may then go through a stage of adapting, which is where we try different ways of dealing with the, the situations. And I'm sure we've all got stories of how we've had to work a different way around things to, to deal with the, the challenges of, of, of the last, um, the last 12, 18 months or so. Um, we might then move to a place of beginning to accept aspects of it, and it begins to normalize the, the uh, situation in our experience. Um, we may get to a place of integration where we're at peace with ourselves and with what's going on, and we've fully adapted and integrated our, uh, into, into the new circumstances that we're in. Now, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross points out that whilst it's presented as this beautifully neat graph uh, that, that moves from one side of the page to the other, um, change responses to change are never that linear, they're never that straightforward. And we can cycle back through areas of the, um, of the experience of, of grief and change, and we can get stuck at times for periods of time too um, in, in those areas. I wonder as, as your you're looking at that, reflecting on your experiences of the last um, year or so, where you, where have you noticed those sorts of um, experiences in your life, in the people that you support, in the people that you, you work with? Being aware of the states and stages that we can go through when we're going through challenging and difficult times, can be really, really helpful. So when we meet challenges, when things become difficult for us, when we experience um, high levels of expectation, stress, we can go into what would be termed psychological trauma. And it's an interesting term because while psychological trauma suggests that it's about our, our mind, um, the, the research evidence that's coming through now about psychological trauma is that actually it's a whole body response. It's a, it's a whole response of the nervous system um, where, when we, we, we reach a place or a situation where we're regarded as, um, as being traumatised. So I'd like to share now a little bit of... Uh, background into um, trauma, um, how it's defined, um, and then look at ways in which it kind of presents itself, the ways in which you, you might recognise it. So first of all, trauma is essentially a emergency response to an overwhelming situation or set of situations. And the um, textbook definition of trauma is quite loose and woolly in a way. One, one, um, one way of defining it, and, and I will recommend this book here, Trauma, uh, Coaching and Trauma, Julia Vaughan Smith. Uh, it's a really well-written, very down-to-earth, straightforward way to look at, look at trauma. And she talks about trauma occurring when the nervous system becomes overwhelmed by too much stimulation. And she talks about too much happening or for too long or it's happening too soon before we're ready for it, or it's happening too fast. And we, for, for, for every single human being, um, we cannot predict what will cause uh, a situation where their nervous system will go into overwhelm and they'll reach a, a point where um, their nervous system goes into a state of high alert, which is um, part of the, the trauma response. Uh, <clears throat> The, the, this, this response is what we call somatic as well as psych psychological. So by somatic, I mean it's in the body. And just as uh, you take an example earlier, that, that exercise that I invited you to do at the beginning of the, the session, where you thought back over some of the things that happened, some of the things that have made you um, feel good over the, the last year or so. When you get that sense of something feeling good, you'll usually get a somatic feeling to a somatic sensation. So you'll get some sort of sensation in the body. It could be in the head, it could be in the shoulders, it could be in the chest, it could be anywhere, where that is a, a physical somatic body sensation that says, 
that um, uh, that you're feeling okay, you're feeling good. Equally, we get these somatic sensations about less positive experiences too. And you think the classic one for many people is if they're feeling anxious, they'll get a sense of something in their chest and their stomach. And, that, and if a person then moves into anxiety becoming panic, that might spread through the chest. So we can we often describe these somatic sensations. And as we observe people, as we spend time with people um, who we suspect might have um, trauma, um, uh, signs of trauma, it's one of the things that we can notice is how they're carrying their body. And it's helpful to ask questions about that to, um, to help to understand what, what kind of um, responses are happening there. Trauma happens when we're pushed over a threshold. So when we have something that is too much for too long, happens too quickly, or um, it happens too soon before we're ready for it, we get pushed over a threshold in, and a part of the brain called the amygdala trips into something called hyperarousal or hypervigilance. Let me just share with you an image of a brain. So there's a brain viewed from the side. We've got the, the bluey purpley bit at the top, which is the, the fancy part of the brain that does all our rational thinking and our creativity and all, all of that clever, clever stuff. And then we've got the, the green part, which is the reptilian brain. That's the very instinctive brain. It's also the part of the brain that deals with all our sort of body functions like heart rate and breathing. And then we've got this yellow part of the brain, which is the, the limbic system. And that's where all our emotions, uh, our feelings, our dreams uh, it, it tend to um, emerge from there. A lot of our memories uh, are made in that area of the brain, which is why memory um, and emotion are so closely linked because they're, they're physiologically linked in the brain. And then we've got this fascinating purple blob in the middle of the brain called the amygdala. And that amygdala, sometimes it's referred to as the lizard brain. It's, it's one of the oldest parts of the brain. And it's the part of the brain that's to do with survival. And what that part of the brain does is it picks up all the information that's coming in from your eyes, from your ears, from your, um, uh, your skin uh, sensors of, of temperature, um, your taste buds, every sense in your body uh, comes into um, the amygdala and the amygdala makes decisions about what's going on around you and makes decisions as to whether it reaches a threshold for um, threat. And if it feels it reaches a threat, a threat Fresh threshold, which is very difficult to say, a threat threshold, the um, amygdala will respond with um, uh, a rise in vigilance and awareness. And with that will come um, the potential for these fight or flight kind of um, responses. And you, if you get to a certain level um, of, of trigger in, in the amygdala, it will uh, raise alarm bells and it will put your whole body onto high alert. Now, when your body goes into high alert, high alert men, most times what will happen is high alert will happen. Um, you'll assess the situation and then you'll either get yourself out of the situation or You'll do something to make yourself safe in that situation. You may defend yourself in that situation. Um, and then your body system should go back down to a normal level of vigilance or a normal level of arousal. But what happens when we get, when, when we, we get triggered um, by the too much, too long, too soon, too fast and reach that threshold is that we go into a permanent state or a near permanent state of hyper arousal, hyper vigilance. And once we get to that state, we, um, we experience a, a lot of symptoms that are uh, symptoms of anxiety. And we're on what we one might call a hair trigger. So the slightest um, stimulus might send us uh, off into um, another heightened state um, of arousal, hyper vigilant state. And <clears throat> for for, for many, many people, um, the first time they have that experience, 
with the, you'll see usually what we will call raw trauma and um, raw trauma is when you see all these signs and symptoms in a person of this over arousal um, and I'll, I'll come on to give you a kind of list of, of those because we do see those um, uh, in, in people around us um, but the the other thing that happens over time what some people do is they create what we call adaptive responses so while some people will be triggered off into these raw trauma responses which are real fear responses um, some create various adaptive responses to avoid or dumb down the experience, or dial down the experiences that they have um, uh, around trauma. I deliberately put that image of a cat there on it because when we go into that trauma state, it's a very primitive kind of response and it, it really harks back to our earliest um, ancestry of that need to stay alert and stay vigilant um, and uh, protect ourselves in, in really hostile environments and although these days we're not we're not always or and, and hopefully not often in hostile environments um, we still have that wiring um, within us um, and it is ultimately, even this trauma response is designed as a protective um, mechanism. So here's a, an interesting um, way of, of putting that, what I've just explained into uh, a diagram. So this is called the window of tolerance. So uh, this is Siegel's work um, in 1999. Uh, that purple window, that purple uh, oblong in the middle is, where we kind of should stay most of the time uh, from, from day to day. So what happens is we go through our day and if our day is quite normal and quite predictable, we'll operate inside this normal level of um, arousal where we'll feel interested in things around us, we'll feel alert, we'll feel awake. Um, at times we'll feel a bit more relaxed uh, and a bit sleepier, but we, it's, it feels normal and it feels okay. You might call it our comfort zone. But if things happen to us that, that start to push us out of that window of tolerance, we're going to higher levels of arousal. So say for example, you meet a, a dog um, or you hear a dog as you're walking down the road and it doesn't sound very friendly. Um, and as you hear that dog, your amygdala, that little uh, purple part in your brain, will raise your level of um, arousal and um, it will make you more attentive to that. And so you'll be reading and picking up a lot more signs around that. And as you walk towards that sound of the dog, or you might decide to walk away from it, that level of arousal will keep feeding, getting feedback from the environment. And um, so your level of arousal may go outside of your normal level of tolerance into that high arousal level. If you get towards that, the sound of that dog and you see that that dog is behind a fence, it looks well contained, um, actually it's tails wagging and you are reading the signs of that dog a little bit differently, you'll come back down again. So you'll come out of that level of arousal and back into that window of tolerance. So that's what kind of uh, happens normally. But when we're pushed outside of that window of tolerance by too much, too fast, too soon, etc we may go across that a threshold, too much arousal. And when we get into that hyper arousal zone, that's the point at which our body system can become so triggered that it's hard for it to go back to that window of tolerance, that normal optimal level of arousal. Now, what's really interesting, and this is where you, you, you might come across this, a raw trauma um, response is seen where um, uh, somebody may have had one of these experiences where they've been pushed into hyper arousal um, and it might have happened yesterday, it might have happened 20 years ago. If there's a trigger in the environment that they're in that pushes them into that hyper arousal zone, you may see that kind of hyper arousal state. And what, what that would look like is uh, wide eyes, um, dilated pupils, um, possibly shaking, um, 
uh, may, may be looking for exits, may be looking for ways to escape, may become abusive, may become angry. Um, and you might see all of those sorts of signs and, and symptoms, um, may cower um, and so on. And they'll do that for a while, but the system, the body system, can't maintain that level for forever. If that person maintains that level where they've got high levels of adrenaline released and high heart rate and high breathing rate, um, there, there comes a point where it's damaging to the body. So what you, you'll get there is, uh, classically, is uh, this hyper arousal with all those, those symptoms and then a crash into hypo arousal. And that's when we drop to the bottom of this, this diagram here. And in hyper arousal, what the system has done is it's it shut itself down, and what we we'll, um, what we might see at that point then is someone who completely disengages. I have a young person I'm, I'm working with uh, in, in one of the schools I work in at the moment, um, and this happens very regularly for her. And I'll I'll find her, and other staff will find her halfway up the stairs, just looking down at the ground, completely um, shut down, not communicating. And um, that, that's a, a classic trauma response, being triggered and then crashing down again. And you might see um, uh, in co-workers or, or young people where um, if they're under a lot of strain and stress, they might then have a period of um, time off work. You might see absence because that hyper arousal is kicking in after they've been into, in that state. They, you, you, you can't physically maintain that. Um, long, long term without having ill effects. Okay. So that hyper arousal, we sometimes see what, what you, you might call freeze. Um, so that this, this table just gives you the, the sort of uh, real life examples, I suppose, of, of what you might see. So when somebody has a raw trauma response um, in, in their environment, um, they become hyper aroused, um, their muscles tense, you might see them appear to be full of energy and that might be quite buzzy. Um, their heart rate and their blood pressure will grow up, go up so you may see a difference in um, um, you know, heart, you might, if, if you can see um, pulse rate at the, uh, the neck then you can see that you might notice that the breathing rate will increase. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that you, you may get differences in coloration as well, based, based on um, blood pressure. You, typically, somebody who gets into that state might say things like, I feel stuck, I can't move. I feel like I'm in cement. I'm, I feel paralyzed. Um, you'll get this widening of the eyes and the dilation of the, the pupils. They're getting ready to either fight or run away. And you know we'll, we'll meet this sometimes in schools in what, what can become a real behavioral situation where uh, a child will um, lash out um, or, or run away. And it can be because they've gone into a trauma state. And um, so noticing these signs early can help us to read the signs that we need to deescalate, that um, we need to give that, that young person space, for example. Um, and it may, escalate into a full fight or flight with some quite irrational responses. So you might see that. Then the other thing you might see is this shutdown, this collapse, where the person's muscle tone looks very relaxed. Um, you might get dipped posture, um, very much reduced heart rate, blood pressure. Um, they, they might complain of feeling cold if, if they can speak because their, their temperature will lower to the surface of the skin. Again, they might not be able to move or speak. Um, they might be very lethargic and they'll appear very tired. You may get, as we do with this young person I mentioned, this blank stare. And in extreme cases, people can pass out when, when they get, that kind of, um, get to that kind of state. It's very difficult for them to reason or rationalize. So a, a, a young person or an adult for that matter who's... Um, who's gone into that um, hyper arousal and then hyper arousal will find it really difficult to follow 
the thread of a conversation and it's definitely not the right time to try and reason um, with them. What that person in shutdown or collapse needs is space and time to come back into a more normal um, arousal state. The other thing that, that um, they'll, if they can talk uh, about is they'll feel quite detached and they might feel numb. So you get two chemicals uh, that get released in this state. One is dynorphin, and that makes us feel a bit out of ourselves, a little bit dissociated and um, endorphin productions. We don't really think of endorphins as being positive things. We get them after exercise, but they can numb us to physical pain. Um, and um, in terms of uh, a shutdown, a collapse, you, you might hear somebody talking about feeling numb. So those are some things that you can sort of recognize uh, someone. The other thing that's really interesting um, about uh, trauma is certainly in adults um, in a, a work environment, in a fairly kind of normalized working environment, you won't see so much of the raw trauma because often adults and some young people have got very good at hiding it and using what we call adaptive responses. So you might see instead um, responses like people pleasing. So trying to appease other people, um, blaming and criticizing. You might notice um, uh, 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 being overly critical um, of others, um, seeking to find, um, uh, pick fault uh, in others. Um, hyper-rationalizing, which is what people often describe as overthinking. So we're trying, or uh, a person who's um, got a lot of uh, trauma experience will often be the person who keeps their mind very, very busy. Now they're not doing this consciously, it's a very unconscious thing, but they might have extensive to-do lists, they might be very driven, and they might complain of their mind never switching off and never being able to, um, uh, to, to, to quieten it down. You also might notice or, or um, uh, experience avoiding in, in that person. So avoiding is where um, they'll shut down um, from uh, interacting with other people. And you often see, this is where addictive behaviors often uh, emerge from. You'll see um, addictive behaviors like uh, gaming, use of alcohol, use of drugs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that um, avoiding pattern, um, and I, I recognize it myself in a, a less uh, extreme way, which is procrastination. Procrastination, I don't know whether anybody here ever experiences that. I'd much rather hoover than uh, get on with certain tasks, particularly if those tasks make me feel anxious or I feel that I'm not up to those, those tasks. Um, which does sometimes happen with some of my work um, works uh, stuff. So avoiding can can range from that very low level uh, uh, procrastination all the way to some really um, full on um, addictive type behaviors um, there. And then the last one, controlling. So that's where we seek to control our environment and sometimes other people. Um, and that can come out of uh, also out of a, um, a a, a trauma kind of um, response. So those adaptive responses, um, I always put a little uh, health warning on these because as I look at those, I can pretty much see that all of those um, in myself, it just because you um, have elements of those uh, behaviors in your, in your psyche doesn't mean that you have trauma um, necessarily. Um, but um, when you're observing others, it's something that can make you aware and make you be cautious and think, actually, I might need to handle the situation with this person in a, in a trauma-informed way, which I'll, I'll come on to um, shortly. So these are not dead certs for major trauma, but they are um, uh, useful signs. Um, that uh, slide hasn't come out very well. Um, I, it's, uh, it's another way of, of looking at some of the symptoms of, of unhealed trauma. Um, 
uh, I stuck this in quite late to the presentation. Um, but um, yeah, so things like a low sense of self-worth can be um, a sign, um, codependent relationships, so um, kind of enmeshed uh, responses to um, enmeshed ways of, of being with other people. Um, shame, you know, a, a real strong feeling of shame. And shame is always about our identity. It's about who, who we are. Um, you know, when we feel guilty, we are... Um, we are feeling something about our behavior, but when we feel shame, it's something that's very, very deep, uh, very, very um, structural um, to us. So that's, um, that's a, a, a always a sign, I think a big sign of, of, of trauma um, uh, being there. So um, I'm really conscious of time and how quickly time go. And I really, we really need to get onto um, how we can work with, with trauma. So if we move into, and if you've got any more, if you have any questions about what I've just talked about in terms of the nuts and bolts of what it is, how to recognize it and so forth, then um, yeah, we we'll, can pick those questions up in, in a few minutes. But how can we work with trauma? So I think there's five principles for working with trauma, um, which are, um, they could be applied to trauma in a, a psychotherapeutic setting but obviously today we're, we're not here as, as psychotherapists unless you are um, but we're looking more generally in terms of I guess workplaces and uh, schools um, community settings so here are five principles that are really useful to be aware of when working um, with trauma so the first one is trauma triggers can be hidden so I've, I've already talked about this raw trauma uh, response that you might see where the, this, this kind of extreme um, uh, high and then crash but we've also got these adaptive responses too so one of the things about working with trauma um, if you if you suspect that um, an environment where uh, people might be experiencing or have experienced trauma is if you're seeing those sorts of raw or adaptive responses um, be more curious, be more aware. The chances are there's, there's something there. Um, and whether it's capital T trauma, which is, you know, the, the, the major kind of traumatic events that we, we talk about, neglect, abuse, um, you know, major accidents, illnesses, um, um, uh, being a victim of, of crime, those uh, and um etc cetera, etc cetera. that those those capital t trauma uh, experiences um uh, but also those that the 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 small t trauma experiences too you know i i have a lot of um clients um i've worked with over the years uh where um they've a lot of really debilitating anxiety uh later in their life and it can be attributed back to what for them was a big trauma event, which was something that went wrong in a school play, you know, where they forgot a line or um, um, uh, and, and they, they felt uncomfortable at that time. And over time, that can be generalized and can grow into something much bigger. We wouldn't probably put that on the big list of, of you know, major traumatic experiences when you look at world events. Um, and what happens to people, but to that individual, it reaches a, a, an important threshold and it triggers the response, which is, um, is, is causing the high anxiety and, and the trauma related response. Trauma triggering can be prevented. So th this, is, this is really important. I think it's really important for schools um, and any kind of community, set, community setting that, um, in order to prevent trauma from happening, um, creating a cultures uh, that are happy and healthy and esteeming is really important. And um, for, so for learning environments, carefully managed learning environments with lots of uh, emotionally intelligent leadership in those um, environments is, is really important. Um, in creating environments where we work with um, kindness and rationality um, rather than fear um, and threat. So that's really, really uh, important. 
trauma triggering can be inflamed by others' behaviours. Um, so belittling, shaming, sarcasm, fear, bullying are all like rocket fuel to um, a person who's already traumatised. And indeed, they can create um, traumatic uh, responses in people. So anything we can do in the environments that we um, work in, support, lead to um, minimise those kinds of behaviours um, is, is really helpful. It can be the case that some of those behaviours around belittling, shaming, sarcasm, fear, bullying can actually come out of people as a response to their own trauma. So we can sometimes see um, at that uh, adaptive response level, though, that kind of controlling type of behaviour um, can actually play out in terms of um, uh, uh, unpleasant um, and bullying type behaviour towards others. What's really hopeful and helpful about um, trauma is it can be downgraded. So any situation where you can help a person to feel a sense of their own self-esteem, of their own strengths, of their own abilities, where you can give them space and allow them that withdrawal time and then support them to reintegrate back into a group or a class or a situation um, in, a, in a healthy, um, esteeming, positive way is not only does it help them get back to that level of uh, a normal level of arousal in, in that diagram that, I, that we looked at earlier, but actually um, it can move them into that last one, which is that it can be healed. So when people feel traumatized, when they feel those, um, those uh, raw trauma responses or the adaptive trauma responses, if while they're feeling that, they can be then nurtured and supported and shown their worth, there's lots of research evidence that shows that that part of the brain that has become traumatized can reset. And this is beautiful. And I think this is a really important part of um, what I, I see as a, a key development in, in education, um, education with kindness that the kinder and more supportive we can be to people in their trauma states, we can help them over time to reset that part of the brain and the whole system gets back into a normal kind of frame again. So those are some principles for working with um, trauma. I just wanted to give you a few, almost some signposts really, to some more specific approaches. So. Somatic trauma-informed coaching approaches are um, uh, ways of, of in a in a one-to-one -one type relationship of using a person's abilities and strengths to help them to resolve trauma. Emotion and freedom technique is something I'm a really big fan of. Um, there's lots of fantastic uh, uh, research evidence coming through now, particularly around the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, Post, uh, EF, EFT, as it's called, is um, using uh, a tapping approach. So we tap various um, pressure points around the body whilst we um, say phrases um, which are affirming and supportive. It, there's a whole process to it. Um, there's, there's a reasonable amount to learn, but you can teach um, pretty much anybody. You can teach them to use that technique to reset their system um, around trauma experiences. And the other thing that is really powerful as a, um, this is much more of a therapeutic approach is using uh, Virginia Satir's transformational practice, um, which is a, a way of um, uh, using a person's strengths and resources to um, uh, resolve and heal trauma. I've put a resource on uh, this web address for you, um, grounding a panic attack. A panic attack can be a real sign of raw trauma um, uh, expressed by somebody. So there's some great um, tips there, uh, which you can download on how to ground a panic attack um, there. Okay. Um, I'm gonna shamelessly plug uh, an opportunity uh, here. Um, 
I run a, a nine hour accredited CPD program um, to look at the uh, trauma informed approaches um, to supporting people with trauma. Um, it goes into a lot more depth than we've looked at tonight. It's evidence based and it teaches you these three approaches uh, in enough um, and safe enough and appropriate enough way that you could start to use them to support people um, or indeed yourself um, through um, trauma recovery. Uh, 48 hours, there is a pretty substantial discount. So the self-study uh, one is, has gone down from 319 to 59 pounds um, until Friday. Um, and the supported study, which is the one that has the accreditation attached to it, um, there's um, just shy of a couple of hundred quid uh, off that one. So if you are interested in taking that further, it's, it's online uh, distance learning, um, and that one has tutor support as well. There's a, a link there to, um, to go to to have a look at that. OK, so main takeaways of the session, and then I'll pick up uh, any questions that you have. So main takeaways about uh, around dealing with um, and supporting people uh, who display trauma symptoms. Be patient. Remember that everyone around us is at a different stage of that change cycle that I referred to at the beginning. And everybody has their own very individual uh, threshold at which um, trauma um, will trigger. So, and I think that's really important for us to remember that when, if, if we've experienced something in our lives that we've just brushed off or we've overcome quite easily, that someone else is having difficulty with it, it's not that, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's really important to still recognize that for that person, and the research really doesn't tell us why yet, but some, for, for whatever reason, um, one person's threshold uh, for a particular experience is here and another is here. And we don't really know why that is, but it's something we need to be really sensitive to. Trauma shows up in this raw way and these um, five adaptive ways. So use all of your senses to pick up information about um, a person and the possibility of, of trauma. It's an automatic survival response. You know, the person is doing, they can't help it really can't help that response in that moment um, it's uh, it's driven by parts of the brain that are not rational the trauma responses are downgraded and healed by making people feel safe and by raising their levels of self-esteem so anything you can do to make the person the environment they're in um, uh, feel safe and to raise their levels of, of of feeling good about themselves really helps high levels of trauma response may be a sign of a need for signposting to support um, if you get somebody who is, um, whose life is being really affected by this, um, or uh, who um, uh, who you can see is triggering very regularly, it may be uh, a sign that, that they need some more um, targeted support. So some counseling therapy in the UK, CAMS referral and so forth, if it's young people. And finally, you can learn simple and effective approaches to working with people that reduce and heal trauma. And um, whether you come through the, the line of my course or whether you, you, you look elsewhere, if you're interested in working um, to support people with trauma, um, then um, some of those approaches we've talked about are, are really, really helpful. I will leave you with this list of resources as we move into um, questions. Um, I'll leave those on the screen for just a moment. Um, Anne, I don't know if we've got any questions that have come up via chat or if anyone wants to hand raise, feel free to do so. 